Today we're going to be talking about memes and the digital vernacular, or what uh, Gene Burgess, a professor of creative industries at Queensland University of Technology, that's in Australia, calls vernacular creativity. Uh, vernacular in this context, or in just in any context, means a kind of non-standardized or a dialect, a localized language that's spoken as one's mother tongue. In other words, it's informally learned, uh, kind of from the bottom up rather than imposed from a top-down or standard or officialized source. So with regards to new media and ver uh, new media, social media vernacular creativity, I think at first blush, one might like to argue that X technology, put whatever technology you want in there, produces or engenders or makes possible any, you know, X, Y, Z, A, B, C form of creativity. Uh, so let's say Reddit or Instagram create whole cloth new expressive forms, uh, but that's a, really a simple answer to a complex question, right? It's often the case that new technologies simply remediate or change existing cultural practices. It's, it's much more uh, a co-constitutive relationship, meaning that they're, they're shaping each other, that technologies and media work in tandem with existing ideologies and values and daily habits and expressive genres. They push and pull and exert force on one another, and it's in those places of friction, so to speak, that new permutations or variations or even brand new cultural expressions emerge. But before we get into all of that, let's first talk about how things are going to proceed for the last remaining uh, week, few weeks of class. So this is what we're going to do first. Preview the rest of the semester. I'm going to tell you about the meme off assignment that's going to be due April 19th. The final reflection journal paper is going to be due April 26th. And then we'll move on to the topic of memes and digital culture. All right, so here's what you need to do by 11.59, Sunday, April 19th. So that is this upcoming Sunday. So these, this is the content that you need to read. That's our topic. If you are Victoria, uh, you are the person who's going to be submitting your discussion leader supplements for everybody else. Anything that's going to be due on Sunday, April 19th is... It's two things. You're going to upload your meme onto D2L by 11.59 p.m. and or your weekly reading notes. So just a, a quick note. If you have not presented in class, if you haven't done the discussion leader, leader duty um, back in the days when we were meeting face to face, or if you haven't produced and uploaded a presentation or some sort of pedagogical material for your specific assigned day or topic, contact me. Uh, it looks like we've got everyone uh, but this one is on you, right? So make sure to check the schedule. I, I should have everyone checked and taken care of. I, it's no, Nothing's really changed, but I just want to make sure that no one fell through any sort of proverbial cracks, right? So uh, that's what's happening this week. Now let's move on to the meme assignment. Uh, the assignment's actually pretty simple, uh, and it should be theoretically fun, which I think we all could sort of use. So there's two steps to this. Really, you're going to be creating an original meme, I'll give more info on that uh, in just a bit on how to do this and what not to do in a second. Uh, but let's put a pin in that for the moment. So again, you're going to make an original meme. Step two, you're going to upload that meme. And it could take a couple of different forms. It could be a JPEG or a PNG or a PDF, some sort of visual image. Uh, it could be a video, potentially. It depends on your background and your skills and how you want to approach this something that I can view and download and do something with. So uh, so you're going to upload that onto the quote-unquote Great British Meme Off Dropbox, that's what the name of it, uh, on D2L by this Sunday, April 19th at 11.59 p.m. Do not forget to do this assignment. Uh, don't turn it in late. Seriously, um, you don't want to lose points and hurt your grade for creating a meme, right? You don't want to like be penalized for not turning a meme in on time. Uh, your shame would be unbearable. Anyway, let's move on. Okay, so as Henry Jenkins, who we've talked about quite a few times in this class, Sam Ford and Joshua Green point out in their uh, 2013 book entitled Spreadable Media, not everyone creates content. Not everyone's creating new media content. Uh, a lot of us share and spread media in ways that uh, we might think of as being more passive than creating uh, original content, what the internet at large likes to abbreviate as OC. I'll be using that designation from here on out, so keep that in mind. All this is to say that although I would wager that nearly all of you have probably liked or commented on and shared memes with your friends online, and in even face-to-face -face context where you like sort of you know hold your phone out and show someone, look at this meme, it's funny, 
Um, this might be the first time that you've ever created your own meme. Congratulations, welcome to the other side of what uh, I'm, I'm not really sure, but this is a moment of transition in your life and I think you'll look back on it fo fondly. So how do you go about making a meme uh, as with things in life, there are a bunch of different ways to solve this problem. Okay, so here are a few of them. There are a variety of applications that allow you to create basic image macro memes on your phone. I'd recommend you check out Memematic. It's free, it's easy to use, you can create your meme, export it, and then you're done. It's very, very easy to use. It will leave a watermark in the bottom left-hand corner of the, uh, the image that you create, whatever meme you create. And there are a lot of memes making fun of the fact that people have made memes with Mematic, and it leaves that sort of watermark. Um, there are also a number of online uh, free websites and platforms, or whatever you want to call them, that allow users to create original memes. I'd give uh, Image Flip a look first, I suppose. The interface isn't really pretty, but it will get the job done. You can make this as elaborate or simple as you want. The assignment is make a meme, right? So if you want to go deeper down this rabbit hole, and perhaps you might because you're trapped in a period of global isolation and you're probably bored or lonely or anxious, stressed, demotivated, or all of the above, and I'm just speaking from my own experience of the COVID-19 crisis here, you might want to get creative with this one. So you can use PowerPoint or the Mac equivalent Keynote to create your meme if you want to. I frequently do that for your class. Um, you can paste an image into the working area, add text over top of it, export it. You can take a screenshot of it. Boom, you've memed. Or you might try to impress your friends and dismay your enemies by using Photoshop. Or you can even try Pixlr, that's the bottom right icon, uh, a free Photoshop sort of clone. Whatever programs, whatever you want to try to do, create something that you're interested in or proud of or thinks cool. Basically, create a meme however you see fit. That might sound like I'm giving you a lot of leeway and creative wiggle room in, in the assignment, and, and that's because I am. That being said, let me tell you what not to do. Okay, so no racist, homophobic, misogynistic, bigoted, etc. memes. We don't need that here. Um, in addition, I would like you to avoid doing any political memes. Honestly, I'm all about political memes in my own life, and we've had them in class, but frankly, life is terrible and complicated and stressful now for everyone. Some for some more than others. Um, I don't want our meme off to become about politics. The topic and substance of the assignment is about memes as a cultural form. Um, political discussion is an important thing to have. We've had it throughout uh, class, uh, but we're going to have that discussion and we've had that discussion at another time. Um, not for this assignment. No personal attacks on other students, ideally. Uh, make a meme about pop culture or social theory, video games. You could make a meme about APSU or COVID-19. Something that's extremely relatable or mundane, daily life sort of stuff. But in general, the be kind uh, policy in our course, uh, that's continuing, right? And if you break that, you're going to get an automatic F for this assignment. That shouldn't be too difficult to avoid, but do avoid that. The second thing to avoid... Reposting. Do not repost. Um, so what do I mean or what does the internet and specifically places like Reddit mean when they use this term? This assignment is not find a cool meme, share it with your class. No, uh, that's a repost or in other words, you're copying a post oftentimes without attributing credit to the original creator, thereby taking credit for the content and someone else's work. In academia, we call this plagiarism. Um, this is bad form. Do not share a meme. I want you to create your very own original meme. Can it be similar to other memes? Yes, absolutely. It almost certainly will in some respect. It depends on the formal elements and social function of the meme, but we'll get into all of that later. All this is to say don't repost. Like you, I am trapped at home amidst the COVID-19 crisis, and this means I'm spending a lot more time on Reddit, and that in turn means I'm seeing a lot more memes. Um, and frankly, memes are kind of one of the main things that are getting me through this whole ordeal. So I'm more likely than ever to discover if a meme that you've submitted is a repost. So don't do it. Okay, so now a quick word on the final paper. I'll provide even more in-depth discussion about the final paper in our next and probably what will be our final video lecture of the semester. For the most part, the assignment hasn't changed, though I am going to be offering you a kind of option. 
I'll probably produce a survey like I have previously, upload it and see what people's responses are and then make my determination based on that. So I'm contemplating making the final paper an optional assignment. So what does that mean? If you're happy with your grade as is, you can opt out of the final assignment. If you want to submit the final assignment in an attempt to boost your grade, then you can submit it. To help make the best decision, I finalized all of the grades on the weekly reading note submissions. Uh, everything else will be graded except for your meme, which you would have not have submitted as of yet. Uh, now let's get to the final paper, should you choose to do it. So the original assignment, so if, if you do choose to do it, here's how it's going to be changing, because it'll, it'll be changed a little bit. I want to give you a break. So even if you decide to do it, you're getting a slight break on the assignment. So the original assignment, which you can see here as a document, was going to re require you to write about nine entries. Uh, each was around two to three pages, though it wasn't super strict. You know, you could write a little entry, nine of them, about your reflections on various and specific moments in your life in which you engaged with popular culture and how pop culture shaped uh, who you are. And, and I mean really profoundly shaped who you are as a person uh, or who you were or who you even aspire to be. In light of everything that we're dealing with and an attempt to improve your and my, to be quite frank, quality of life, we're going to drop that down a bit. So if you've completed nine entries, if you've already been working on this throughout the semester, you're done. Great. You are the best, and you can now imagine me high-fiving you. If you're into high fives and that sort of thing. So you've done the assignment. If you haven't been writing the journal throughout the semester, first off, boo, hiss, shame. Uh, I wrote my little note to shame you. Uh, second off, I want to reduce the total number of entries from nine down to five. So that means if you do the final assignment, you're going to submit five two to three page entries. And you'll just turn that all in as a single document. And while I had originally and in many ways still do envision this, envision this largely being a reflection journal that focuses mostly on your past and thus your self-formation in childhood and adolescence and so forth, it seems to me you're likely using popular culture and various forms of media content to entertain yourself, to escape the realities of daily life right, life right now, to cope as a vehicle for self-expression, or whatever you can tell me. So what I'm saying is that you might also include one entry about how you're using pop culture uh, in your life right now in the middle of a pandemic that's distributed just about every, uh, disrupted just about every element of our daily lives. So if you decide to do the final assignment, uh, it'll be five entries, not nine. And I will be posting, as I said, I'll post a link probably from SurveyMonkey as I did previously, and I will ask all of you, all 20 of you, do you want to make the final assignment uh, optional, okay? So let's turn to our uh, topic at hand, memes. This gentleman uh, who's hiding in bushes is Richard Dawkins. He's a British evolutionary biologist, and he's perhaps best known, at least for the purposes of our discussion this week, for his 1976 book entitled The Selfish Gene. Dawkins describes, he coins the term memes, but he also describes memes as a unit of cultural transmission or imitation or replication. That's to say any sort of cultural form or patterning of being, an idea, a belief, a behavior, aesthetics, values, and so on, that spread through imitation. A meme is like a gene, hence the, the term a meme itself looking a lot like the word gene, that self-replicates, that mutates and develops as it spreads through time and space. Obviously, human beings, and indeed all forms of non-human animal, uh, have learned shared behaviors, what we have from day one in this class discussed and called culture. So Dawkins coins a term um, to describe a social phenomenon that obviously long predates what we now think of as digital or internet culture, right? Even the book Selfish Gene predates that. Um, keeping that in mind, I want to first look at a few examples of expressive forms that, in effect, operate as a kind of analog equivalent or a forerunner of what we now think of when we say the word memes. So I'm going to just focus on or provide you a few examples of each of these. I'm not going to delve too in, uh, in too much detail on them. If you're interested, do a bit of Googling. All right. So Kilroy was here is an Americanized version of an earlier image text structure or more motif that was found in Australian graffiti in World War I uh, called Foo was here. 
in Australia, American soldiers would draw Kilroys on walls and other structures at various locations throughout the Second World War. And you can still see these, you know, throughout the country now, and sometimes on the internet, obviously. In uh, Bloomington, Indiana, where I got my PhD, there's a, a restaurant called Kilroys. Latrinalia, things written or drawn onto bathroom walls, typically, and this is important, water kind of conceptualizes public spaces. The above images that you're seeing here are from folklorist uh, Ruth Hazelton's research blog called The Hidden Culture. Um, give that a search. Uh, the specific article in question that's from that blog, the entry is The Writing on the Walls, Latronalia Graffiti from the Restroom. It's from 2016. If you're interested in Latronalia, I don't have you do any assignments based on Latronalia in this class and other classes I do. Uh, you should check out another folklorist work, Alan Dundas. Um, he's the person who coined the term and also has done in my opinion, the best work. He's kind of the leading figure. Um, sadly, he's passed away. He's a really brilliant and interesting person. So what is Latronalia? It's oftentimes it contains motifs like images. Uh, it's jokes, poems, quotes, and other things that are like little bite size, uh, easy to remember and reproduced units that kind of congeal or settle into a relatively stable pattern structure as they're imitated through acts of repetition and as things get repeated, there people introduce, human beings introduce variation. So it's repetition with variation. Chain letters. This is probably one of the reasons I first pursued or became interested in the vernacular and what I later, when I, I got my master's degree in folklore studies, because of chain letters as, as a young child, my, I remember my mother coming up from the mailbox and saying like, oh, that's another stupid chain letter. I'm tired of these things and being handed it and staring at it and reading it and being fascinated and, and kind of afraid that if I didn't send this letter around, we would you know be witnessing bad luck for seven years. So chain letters are physical letters that were mailed to a recipient and the letters attempted to convince the receiver to sometimes send money or sensitive information, but they almost always included a call to action for the receiver to make additional copies of that letter and then to mail those additional to an additional number of recipients. Um, they had a kind of built-in mode of reproduction and circulation, kind of like a virus, right? It's, it's viral. Although chain letters have existed since at least the early 20th century, the, they sort of exploded in popularity in the, the late 1980s and 1990s, when I just happened to be uh, a child and growing up, just prior to the early and widespread adoption of email by consumers which is really interesting. Very quickly, these forms, uh, these kinds of expressive forms or speech genres emerged into this new channel of communication. So they went from existing in an analog context and ev eventually they were just mediated over to this new platform, email. So there's more that we could unpack uh, there from myths and jokes and urban legends and other kinds of patterned expressive forms that circulate um, and then inspire uptake and reproduction. Uh, but that, th this is going to have to su suffice for the time being. In a previous lecture on media convergence and participatory culture, we talked through a ma major developments in the history of the internet and thus internet culture. I just want to represent that same information in a new way here before we move along. A lot of what we now understand as memes originated well before the rise of social networking sites or what we now call new or social media in the early 2000s. On, and they developed on personal web pages and forums and content that was shared through peer-to-peer -peer communication in emails and the like. I'll highlight a few early examples of internet memes uh, here in a sec, but I think it's really important to think about the ways in which social media platforms like Facebook, Reddit, 4chan, Vine created the conditions of possibility for new kinds of communication, media ideologies, and communities to emerge around these spaces or in these spaces or even between these spaces. These various platforms shaped and were shaped by individuals and communities, patterns, uh, patterned behaviors, and their ideas. Um, so let's look at some particular examples of early memes. And I just want to say that uh, forcing Keynote, the program that I'm using to, to generate the animation that you saw above there, took way too long uh, to figure that solution out. It's actually an animation that I created, exported, and then put an animation into Keynote and then animated over the animation. It was a headache, so hence the Peter Parker there. All right, so here are some of the classic, like if you were going to go through a rogues gallery of various memes, here are some that you may have never seen or you may know about. I'm just going to mention some of these briefly. If you're interested, go check them out. Typically, know your meme would be where I would point you to. So the Dancing Baby GIF, 1996. 
um, then created in 1998 by then art student Deidre LeCart. Um, she published the Hamster Dance on uh, GeoCities, a web hosting site that launched around in the mid 1990s from web vanity web pages or personal web pages uh, that oftentimes they would have like a hit counter or a visitor or a web counter down at the bottom that would tell you how many people had visited uh, your web page. Those, those aren't really common anymore. Back then you would try to urge people to come to your, to your website and have that count, you know, go up. And uh, she created this as a kind of incentive to get people to come to the, to, to visit her page. They're demotivational posters. Um, it is obviously a parody of motivational posters that you would see in high schools and offices that were created in the 80s and 90s. Despair Inc. began creating demotivational posters and or what are called demotivators in 1998. These spread like wildfire on the internet. Around 2006, Lolcats emerged as a form which, like demotivational posters, was composed of an image and superimposed text. Lolcats emerged first on 4chan and then migrated to other online spaces. There were, of course, early Flash games and animations. So Flash Player was developed in 96, and it's actually dying either now or later in this year. Uh, 2020's been really hard on our hopes and dreams as well as Flash Player. There's Homestar Runner and Trogdor and all these sorts of things. If you don't know about those, give that a Google and have yourself a good time. There was All Your Base Are Belong to Us. It's a poorly rendered English translations, translation from a 1992 Sega Genesis port of a 1989 arcade video game called Zero Wing. In the early 2000s, it begins circulating on uh, the Something Awful website, and that website began in 1999, and it's still operational. At the same time, or about the same time, there are Rage comics that were developed um, these are simply mostly kind of black and white line drawings of cartoon faces that express some sort of emotion or reaction. The, the Rick Roll developed uh, in the mid to late 2000s. It involves a bait and switch where an internet user is unexpectedly presented with Rick Atsley's uh, 1987 song, Never Gonna Give You Up. Then we've got things like Nyan Cat here in the center, Scumbag Steve to the left, and Bad Luck Brian uh, on the right and so on and so forth. So there are this, there's this giant collection uh, of kind of early internet memes that are through reproduction and recreation and recombination that sort of are still carried with us uh, into this day. So all of this operates and keeps going so on and so forth. So if you're interested, I'd recommend you check out Know Your Meme. It's an incredibly useful resource and it's an important part of internet cultural heritage. So give that a look. You also have things like internet challenges that are, you know, patterned behaviors that are reproduced through imitation. So there's a ton of these things. So there's planking in the early 2000s, uh, or uh, excuse me, 2010s. There's the cinnamon challenge where you eat a spoonful of cinnamon. That happens around the late 2010s. There's Tide Pods around 2017 and 2018. And right now, most horrifyingly, there's the coronavirus challenge that a few small, thankfully a small number of people have done. All right. So... Over time and through repetition, there's a kind of development of a sense of etiquette and a set of values and expectations about the proper use of various memes and meme templates. For instance, there's the awkward moment seal that you're seeing now. It's an image macro genre known as advice animals that's traditionally used to describe awkward situations. So you could select this image and then superimpose text over it using one of those platforms or programs that have you know, suggested you use for your own memes, put text and tell someone about something awkward that you experienced. In 2011, there's Success Kid. It's actually just a child holding a handful of sand tightly clenched in his little fist, but it becomes traditionalized through repetition with variation to express some sort of success. In 2012, we get Confession Bear. It's a vehicle for discussing taboo subject, or as the name suggests, confessing a, a kind of secret or sharing a controversial opinion. Right? So each one of these forms develops, and over time, maybe even from the start, th these structures develop, uh, and through imitation, can people continue to, to produce new forms within this kind of expectation of, of what that structure does. So through recycling and recombination and remixing, individuals are able to creatively appropriate mostly media content that exists that they themselves didn't originally produce that exists out in the public sphere. They're grabbing it and recombining it and doing interesting things with it. So they're creatively appropriating, or what Henry Jenkins had talked about previously, textual poaching. 
They're taking these publicly circulating materials, text and ideas and images, you name it, to create novel forms that entertain and gain attention and garner likes and shares and thus spread. So here we have the blinking guy meme and then two structures that someone has, you know, very creatively modified this structure that is well known. There's a simple pleasure in repetition and seeing something that's familiar, but also seeing something familiar in a new light or done differently, right? It's really, really, it's interesting. It's the thing that, at least for me, brings me back uh, to memes in places like our memes on, on Reddit. All right, so there's no film suggestion. I don't have any films to suggest this week. I have, I can just say personally, been watching a lot of Better Call Saul. It's just an excellent show. Um, if you haven't been to Reddit, I would highly suggest this week that you go check out it's r forward slash memes if you're unfamiliar with Reddit. So if you want to just Google it, uh, the search function in Reddit's not that great in my opinion. So just r forward slash no space memes, and then go there and search and find some things that are inter interesting and entertaining, and that might also provide you with some examples and ideas when you're creating your own meme. So that's it for this week. Uh, have a great week. Email me or anything if you need anything whatsoever. Take care. I'll talk to you later. Bye.